6.59, one minute before we begin for those of you on Facebook and And I've now admitted our guests who were patiently waiting in the waiting room. Thank you for waiting. It's just seven o'clock and we're live on Facebook. And since you're all here wonderfully on time, thank you for being here on time. Um, I'll begin. Good evening, everyone. I'm Akua Leslie Hope speaking to you from the ancestral land of the Onondaga, also known as the Seneca, keepers of the Western Door in the Southern Finger Lakes region of New York State. I pay homage to the Seneca past, present, and future as I do to my own ancestors by whose grace I exist and am sustained. I join His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, and other Nobel Peace Prize laureates in rejecting war and nuclear weapons. I hope you will join me in doing the same. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Afrofuturist pastoral speculative poetry, a quarterly reading and report. This is the first one. I expected to be joined by another poet editor artist, but we don't see her yet. So when she comes, I'll announce her and I plan to introduce her more fully later. I wanna grant in to explore, consider and write Afrofuturist pastoral, speculative poetry for 2022 from the New York State Council on the Arts. I thank them for this affirmation and support. This event is funded in part by poets and writers with public funds from the New York State Council on the Arts with the support of the New York State Legis Legislature. And I want to begin by defining terms. So, and, and setting the ground, telling you a little history about how I came to think about Afrofuturist pastoral speculative poetry. Science fiction is something I inherited from my father in particular. He was a second generation American whose parents migrated to the US from Montserrat. Similarly, my mother's folks immigrated to the US from Jamaica. They all dreamed a black future and as Garveyites, they were all Afrocentric. They all met and married in New York City in a mythic community that still exists called Harlem. They sought a new destiny that they could not find in their oppressed colonial islands in the Caribbean. They brought African diasporic dreams to this land. Afrofuturism is an ever evolving collective aesthetic that sees black people in the future. Just as my grandparents envisioned our family in the future, their children going to college and creating their way in a newly imagined world. I recall hearing Sun Ra in the 60s. He's an Afrofuturist icon. And I met him in person when I was a DJ at Columbia University's radio station. Space is the place, he said to me, and me and my buddy sang. <laughs> from planet to planet in the subway after hearing him. My Afrofuturistic heroes included the 
Funkadelics that Sister Dusty had stayed with us at Williams College. We tasted the maggots in the mind of the universe and later knew the mothership had landed. Afrofuturism is a speculative genre that imagines a future through the lens of the African diaspora. The term was coined in 1990s, in the 90s, by a Mark Deary, who argued that people descended from Africans enslaved during the time of the transatlantic slave trade are effectively alien abductees who are experimented on, brutalized, and marginalized. Speculative poetry, the poetry of possibilities, I call it, includes alternate history, cryptids, monsters, cyberpunk, cyberpunk, dystopia, fairy tales, fabulism, fantasy, folklore, futurism, horror, magic, mythology, occult, paranormal, robot, science fiction, shifters, slipstream, solar punk, space opera, superhero, supernatural, sword and sorcery, sword and soul. Where am I? Long list. Steampunk, steampunk, time travel, post-apocalyptic and weird. It takes all poetic forms plus sci-fi coup. Pastoral, that's the other part of that long descriptor, refers to rural subjects and aspects of life in the countryside. People have written about the country and nature forever. And the lovely anthology, Black Nature, four centuries of African-American nature poetry comes to mind as a reference. Check it out. The speculative and the pastoral are old modes, confluent genres from as far back as John Milton's Paradise Lost in the 17th century and Edmund Spencer's The Fairy Queen in the 16th century, both epic poems and foundational to English literature. But to do nature and country through a speculative lens and also imagine that through an Afro-futurist lens, well, this is the task before me. Let me tell you about where I am, this rural agrarian area was a major stop on the Underground Railroad, home to one of the most successful conductors ever. I don't know if you've heard of him because I hadn't till I came here. His name was John W. Jones. He freed more folks than Harriet Tubman, a recorded 800, possibly a thousand. And he became rich, burying, 3,000 Confederate soldiers. Harriet Beecher Stowe's brother, Reverend Thomas Kennecott Beecher, led a church nearby. And Mark Twain, who wrote at Quarry Farm in Elmira, supported the abolitionist effort. In the past, I conducted oral interviews with African-Americans born in the area when the landscape and the road system was less development, when the airport was just a field. What I'm attempting to do that I've seen bits of, but not all put together, this speculative Afrofuturist pastoral poetry makes me think back to Mrs. Esther Berlin, my Moroccan Jewish French teacher in high school, who introduced me to the negritude poets. The one I returned to was Aimé Césaire, the Martinican master of myth and Caribbean majesty, drenching every line with a deep love of place and transformation. Well, I recently found a predecessor voice and John Joseph, I hope I'm going to say his name right. I have no one to instruct me. So John, probably John 
Joseph, Rabea Revalo, a Malagasy, Malagasy slash Madagascan poet who is widely considered to be Africa's first modern poet and the greatest literary artist of Madagascar. Here's a description of him. With remarkable originality, Rabea Ravelo synthesized Europe's prevailing urban surrealism with his own comparatively bucolic surroundings. And in Rabe Ravelo, we are offered the wildly innovative imagery of modern realism permeated with the essence of traditional oral poetry. I'm going to read a piece of his for you. So you can feel when I'm feeling in this incredible discovery of this fabulous voice who, who left too soon. This is number 17 from his book, um, Traduit de la Nuit, or Translated from the Night. I'm gonna read it in English. The black glass maker of whom no one has ever looked upon his countless eyes and his shoulders even, that none has ever made shrug this slave all adorned with beads of glass, who is as robust as Atlas and who carries the seven heavens upon his head. People say the multifarious river of clouds will carry him away, the river where his loincloth has already been soaked. Thousands and thousands of fragments of glass fall from his hands, but rebound toward his brow bruised by the mountains where the winds are born. And you witness his daily torment, his labor without end. You witness his thunderstruck agony as sea conchs resound to the ramparts of the east. But you no longer feel pity for him and it no longer even occurs to you that his suffering begins again each time the sun capsizes. This man wrote this in 1930-something. So that's a source of inspiration. I'm reading, I'm studying. And um, I will now read you what I've written this year. These are all new poems. And I'm very uncomfortable. <laughs> this is pushing the envelope for me, folks. I usually only read things that have already been published. So I have the imprimatur, <laughs> the affirmation that some voice outside of my head um, heard and liked it. I prefer to think about my poetry a lot more. But the charge of this project, as I told you at the beginning, is this quarterly reporting, is this writing and sharing. And I'm excited to share. Thank you for being here. I'm delighted to do it. So I've got one, two, three, four, five, six. That's six, two, four, six, I think seven. Um, there's one poem that will be slightly older. I wrote it in December, but every, and I'll tell you that one when we get there. So uh, this first one is called Things Glimpsed on Rings. So I'm glancing at my audience. I know some of you, uh, you're at least American. And I say that because, oh, cat, cat, people see the beautiful cat, cat's listening. Um, I say that because this is a short poem, but I have a critique partner who's Canadian, and she said things that, well, okay, let me read the notes first, then I'll read the poem, and you'll see what I'm saying. Ring is the 
colloquial, maybe only local name for the Ring Video Doorbell, a popular alarm system that records anything approaching the place at which it's installed and notifies the user. If you're familiar with that, just nod and let me know. Familiar with that? Okay, I see some, good. Blackhawks, Chinooks, and Osprey are types of military helicopters, something she didn't know. She was saying, I only know a Chinook is a kind of wind. And I was like, it's a kind of helicopter. Ra-cha-cha is an irreverent name for the city of Rochester, New York whose literacy rate is a mere 57%. Horseheads is the name of a town in Chemung County. Cooper's Plain is the name of a hamlet of 600 in the towns of Irwin and Campbell. And Painted Post is a hamlet named for a Native American Painted Post in Steuben County. So this is a very local poem, but hopefully other people can appreciate and enjoy it too. A lot longer than the poem. Things glimpsed on ring. Next door, oh, one more thing. Next door, that's the first line. Next door is an app that's like Facebook, but for neighborhoods. Okay, now I can read the poem. Next door, neighbors share ring videos. The missing alien sometimes resembles a cat child or dog bear. Shiny, wet, black streaks unclear in the grainy dark of snow streaked streets. Chinooks spotted in painted post, hovering, hovering, remind that there are bases nearby. Chinooks make passes over Cooper's Plains, afternoons tattooed with sounds of chopped ear. It's never clear. Pied pipered pets disappear. Double rotors circle against high stratus clouds. Ra-cha-cha or horse heads, army reserves, frothy atmosphere from no one knows where. Pictures shared of foot paw prints which disappear with rise of day. Black hawks refuel at Corn Elm Airport. Osprey with side props over Cooper's Plains. Search for those unnamed things glimpsed on ring. Things glimpsed on ring. Okay, someone's making noise. So please, let's see, do I have to? Yeah, I'll mute you. Okay. Bigfoot hereabouts. The Bigfoot group meets on next door, compares notes of sightings, arrange for socially distant hiking. They're always inviting, there's room for one more. The hills are higher than we bargained for, where rattlers and ruins await, where our contraband was once contained when flat fields below war tobacco. Now pumpkin remnants ret remain, await the spring strawberry picking across the road from baby Christmas trees and furry horses mutating to meet the harsh season. Where thermals flow and lift soaring planes, gliders float in silence and see the world unfurl below, glimpse the darting shadows of dancing trees or something else massive, moving slow. Why are Elmyran children so constrained while mysteries roam our undulating hills, disarm their anger in these woods, suck out their violence on these trails, loose them to search with you for Bigfoot, 
dodge mean snakes and poison ivy. Learn this lore of green and growing ready and free them from unknowing what waits unsought, unbought, unseen still. Bigfoot hereabouts. This next poem made me think of, well, something I saw made me think of the poem and I was like, I'm glad I at least attempted in this poem to talk about this understanding of sentience. Now, I don't know if any of you look at PBS. There was a show on PBS about slime mold and they had slime mold solve a maze slime mold solved a maze and i also th thought of when i wrote this poem how prescient our beloved genius stevie wonder is because he wrote about music about the secret life of plants okay so think of the secret life of plants and and the idea of sentience. And I shouldn't even say that much, but like I said, it's a new poem, so <laughs> I can't help myself. Squirrel Information Highway. We don't know how they see. We thought their motion involuntary, sw swayed by an invisible reason. Shadow breezes shoving bouncing weight of squirrels running along their high trunks upward into their many armed branches. As bushy tails coiled, flap fluffed, bristled for balance, we thought, not signal, not semaphore, not conduit, not mobile antenna as communication crossed species already connected, co-evolved cooperant conspirators using the base pulse that runs through us all. And so that leap is a wave, currents sign, this rogue highway of electric lines crisscrossing our neighborhoods just above tree limbs and twigs and through sometimes surrounded by leaves, held by paws, grasped by claws where winged ones roost and dip in conversation. They're not all talking about us. They know well what we've destroyed and dismiss our indiscretions. They're planning on the wood wide web not for our demise, just for their own survival. They're summoning, they're summoning, they're summoning help. Squirrel Info Highway. How She Blew for Betty Carter, Sarah Vaughan, my eternal favorites. Crossroads, she met herself down there. A blue bedazzlement blazing possibilities, multiplying and collapsing stars, blooming black hole implosive, borrowing from her multiplicities, recombinant potentiality, swapping knowings across fragrant sonics, how she came to architect souls, priestess, reshaping sound, how she blew. My mother, she ate me. This is the one I wrote in December. My mother, she ate me. Our mother was always eating us. She ate me. She ate all her babies, she said proudly. Through her we came, and to her we might return in bits. She made us and would tell me, I brought you into this world and I can take you out of it. 
one of her many preparatory threats, like wipe that smile off your face, watch your mouth, fix your face, which was hard to do having been bitten. But good therianthropic training for my shape-shifting future in a voracious world. I had a father too. He could fix many things and my face. He was brave and would do this while she was looking, but not so she could see. He would tell me in my head, it's okay, baby, I got you. Holding a buffer pattern of my original whole so I could be reconstituted and transmitted forward. My mother, she ate me. Oh, this is the last one. Okay, so uh, there's a note on this. There's a show that I found really uh, moving on TV called uh, Foundation, although it differed from the foundation, the, um, I don't remember if I read all three by um, Isaac Asimov, but in this depiction of Foundation, there's one of the main characters is Gail Dornick, depicted as a woman of color from a poor water planet of subsistence algae farmers. And she solves the Abraxas conjecture using Callie's ninth proof of folding. So the title of this poem is Abraxas Conjecture. What he saw was the contrast, the dark void, a maw, not a womb of creation, the absence of what strikes the lit bulb of our wet globe, a blue jewel, and yet all is illusion. This darkness full of light traveling, full of light traveling, full of what his eyes cannot perceive, the dark empty, he said. But here on the ground, we see hope each night emptied of our hungry burnings, empty of our primitive exhalation, empty of our killing ways. We flow full, speckled heaven aloft, winks, blinks, shines, spinning, singing to us. Can you hear it? Can you hear it? It is not empty. It is full. Can you hear? It is full for now, radiating sound, light, sound. We were seeded from the sky. We were elsewhere conceived. Sift the dark noise. It will happen again. Read another spectrum. We landed and bloomed. It will happen again. Feel another vibration, depths of the next dimension, dear to commingle the intersections, metamorph this welling up. Taste another sound, this sacred seeding. She births a chaos of information from compassion, feeds it her milky way, enunciating. It will happen again. It will happen again. It will happen again. All sleepers awaken by the light. Thank you for listening. And it's 728 and our other poet isn't here. So I can entertain questions or conversation if you'd like. Um, if you've got something and let's see, I'll change I'm the here. I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, I'm under a different name. I'm on someone else's laptop. Oh, oh my God. Well, great. This is excellent. It's 720. Well, folks, it's 729. Uh, you are unmuted. Well, let me do the introduction. Like I, oh, this is cool. 
you know, I just kept reading the names. I said, she's not here. She's not here. Oh, well. Okay. So now Jack has shuffled it, shuffled it away. Okay, bear with me, folks, because this is a wonderful, wonderful person, and I want her to be, where did I put it? Here we go. Uh, and so also, I in the chat is a document that says bios. I hope you all can see that. After the welcome, there's bios for chat. Okay, so I'm glad she's here. Thank you for being here. Jacqueline Johnson is a multidisciplinary artist who works in poetry and fiction as well as fiber arts. She's the author of A Women's A Woman's Season, Main Street Rag, and A Gathering of Mother Tongues, winner of the White Pine Press Poetry Prize. A Cave Canem Fellow, Earth Institute Fellow, and recipient of awards from the New York Foundation for the Arts and the Middle Atlantic Writers Association. She has taught poetry at Pine Manor College, the City University of New York, Poets House, Very Special Arts, Amani House, the Fred Frederick Douglass Creative Arts Center, and African Voices. Her writing has recently been published in Trouble the Waters, Tales from the Deep Blue, 2022, Revisiting the Elegy in the Black Lives Matter era, The Slow Down American Public Media, number 233 on the D train, About Place, Resistance and Resilience, which she also edited, Speculating Futures, Black Imagination and the Arts, and the Brooklyn Poets Anthology. Welcome, Jacqueline Johnson. Yay, she's here. So that thing that says J. LaPont, that's Jacqueline Johnson. Yeah, she's my alter ego. Oh, you're alter ego. Thanks well, for me. Akua. Akua, I am never a no-show. Just know that. <laughs> I have never been a no-show. Um, let's see. I want to uh, dedicate this reading to uh, the memory of Tony K. Bambara. Today is her birthday. She would have been 83. Uh, and I loved her dearly, dearly. And I'm, I happen to be in my birth city, Philadelphia, today, uh, attending AWP. And um, I've been uh, just enjoying myself visiting different aspects of the city. I'm going to open with a poem from my first book, A Gathering of Mother Tongues, and it's called In the Eye of Storm. I gather the calm of yesterday's wishes over burning fields of truth. I hold in my hand my heart, dreams, vision song, through broken bits of mirror, glass, elusive flutter of fins. Between wet suck of thighs, I carry my dream children. Though I turn into tree, then song. Under blackened earth, they find my name and others of my clan. Way underneath the rocks, green shoots grow. They burst through my blindness, feed at the long foot of my fox. I buy purple night winds alone, bank smooth stones along the footpath to my soul. In the eye of storm, they find shelter, ancient spider strength in the winding clover of my lies. A riotous lust assaults the senses. Mr. Perfume of the spirits, respectfully, tenderly, I carry flame of their life's desire on my head. We regather under shining waterfall of my eyes. I give in to the broken clay of my hands, moving deeper and deeper into the wide arc of truth. Um, the next poem I'm going to read um, comes out of, uh, <laughs> I wasn't a huge fan of The Matrix, but I really did love Gloria Forster in it. Um, so this is one of the uh, oracle poems that I've done. Um, and this is in her voice. How many times had she gone through The Matrix? 100, 2,000 times. She had so many names. Mama. Dita, Nana, Ia, Aloje this, Aloje that, Queen, daughter, Naima, 
mistress of secrets, Sangoma, Ser, storyteller, liar, witch, diva, bitch, poet, Kali, my Louisa, girl, Mary, sister, woman, come here, divine one, infinite beauty, Yamaja, Sarah, oracle, on and on and on they call, praying, searching her many endless paths, calling her many long-lived names. Um, the next one I'm reading is from um, my second book, A Woman's Season. Um, and this is called Earth Daughter and it's in a few, it's in two sections. One, motherwort, lobelia, sassafras, nettles, sage, alfalfa, southern bell lifts up tangerine sky with that hat, peek out under its brim, confident and strutting. Instead of dogs, maybe they are your familiars, bouncing in joy-filled abandonment, coldness and dew on their paws and noses, sister they call you. Anything green you can grow, babies lingering in the womb, fall into your open hands. Women, men, and children gladly swallow steep teas made of weeds, trees, and herbs. Mulyang, burdock, cumin, shepherd's purse, rose hips, peppermint. Your spirit a beacon to the river's hidden ways. All illnesses have three roots, greed, guilt, and hate. Early morning walk to meet the others in a lavender field by the river. There is nothing the water cannot handle. Everything you bring her, she can store. What sorrow, what pain is too much? Bring it to the river. She can carry you over it and more. Two. Tears that formed rivers, rivers we swam across, healed and whole. I come from a clan of seeing women, ancient and new at the same time. Sister, just because you can see across the veil does not mean you forgo the journey. Each step as precious as the one before it, each herb a brass bell unto itself. Wicked spiral of energy swerving through us all. Healed everyone across the county for two generations. A woman then could be that whole, could be that giving. And let's see. Um, I wanted to read uh, maybe two of these triolets. Um, all right. Um, Senegambia Blues Triolet. Uh, the crossing. On River Gambia, slate and turtle bad wings. Men and women stand 50 strong in pyros. Big bags, mothers and children all lean. On River Gambia, slate and turtle bad green. Each wave is a prayer sung to the shoreline. No room to sit, they are one communal breath. On River Gambia, slate. And curl that green. Men and women stand 50 strong in five oaks. Um, the other one I'll read is Catholic Church, Gory Island. We stand in clusters, tourists among sacred few, black saints and angels watching over us. Priests prayed over slavers in African pews. We stand in clusters. Tourists among sacred few, our prayers almost pagan, desiring the new. Light no candles, claim no victory, songless. We stand in clusters, tourists among the sacred few, black saints and angels watching over us. Um, this is called Cosmic Rhythms. And this is the poem that opens uh, a woman's season. Cylindrical view of the double-sided, mother, daughter, and the Holy Ghost, African ox circumference centuries, through rumble of zigzag, yin-yang, DNA dance, a double helix, splendid threads, 
life wraps around. Ancient path that God has traveled, circle within the circle within. Magnificent twirling that turns women into mothers. Look again, could be a sombrero or Saturn's many rings. See the dervish whirling, bringing with him a wisdom that is always out of bounds. Blink of an iris blessed with vision. Oh, take me on the road which spirals round and round, round and round. A galaxy of wounds teeming with life. In a corner, smooth black oreo. This great tick humanity feeds from. Um, and, uh, are we, okay, we're doing okay time wise. Um, I want to read um, uh, um, this poem. It's called Awiki for George Washington Carver. And the Awiki is an African form. Uh, you usually find it in Nigeria. It's a praise poem form. Um, and I, I'm trying my hand at it. <laughs> um, scientist, naturalist, creator, synthesizer, experimenter. Son of the woods, son of the earth, just born son of slavery, just born son of freedom. And you, the wildest weed, quickens and reveals its meaning. Divine sight, indivisible, dance of myotosis. Only you could see 300 ways to use a peanut. Only you could find 200 properties of jams. Your father with most of two to sharecroppers, women and children of the fields. Season, experimenter, one year planted cotton. Next year you planted yams. Crop rotation is land medicine. Interplay of rhythmic pulses. Polish Tuskegee man, you look happiest in overalls. Tweed jacket, applejack. Your gaze cast over a field, herbs in hand listening to the orchestra of all living things. Um, let's see. All right, I'm gonna read a poem that was recently published in a About Place journal. Um, and it's a poem that I started in a workshop with Annie Finch many years ago. And the last year or so, I found, I found a way to bring it to life. Mind of my mind. First lesson of air. Softly remove impediments. Camera, shawl, shoes, sweater. Surrender worn out thoughts. Oh, shoots of worry. Joy, a new gift. Weaving its grace like a bee going flower to flower. I learned to drop pride. Mass become a different song. Second lesson of air. Watch her dance over green sheets and grapevines. How each leaf bends, rises in her caress. Heal and art to earth. Third lesson, just breathe. Follow the flow from throat to heart, diaphragm to womb. Listen to the body. Let it tell you its secrets. Follow breath all the way down to your feet. Fourth lesson, follow the air coursing over a navel, hidden by feathers and waist beads, circular swivel, back and forth, frenetic samba of lovers, dance, the body can fly without wings. Fifth lesson, enter the wave soliloquy, when turning feet and legs. Be smart enough to open your chest wide. Trust he will return you breathless, yet alive to your own life. And this one's called African Woodwind. Uh, and it's for the late Yusef Walayaya, who was a wonderful musician. Um, he played all types of wind and strengths. And he was one of the first people I met when I came to Brooklyn uh, a thousand years ago. Um, this was called African Woodland. 
Your body is a broken piece of mahogany. God laughs through you, the beat within the drum itself. Mischievous elfin, cut your tongue with palm wine. Palm wine, marks from another life. You a bad Osabisa, playing drums with hands and feet. Your whole body a rhythm section. You and Kali, 20 years ahead of time, playing four funky flutes through your noses. Original African prana yoga, African woodwinds caressing the air. And Yusuf was just one of those people that was way ahead, just way ahead of everybody. Um, we're just now arriving to what he was doing. Um, so anyhow, um, all right. So should I try to go to like 750 and then we can, okay, all right. Um, this poem was called Annunciation and uh, it's gonna be, Coming out in print, I just can't remember the publication. <laughs> it, 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 was it an E or an A? A, Annunciation. Um, all right, too many things on my head. Walk three miles of the Dafuski shore all night with a hope the morning tide will return most gentle of men. At least then you could hold him in your arms one last time. The Lutheran found you with your long Cherokee hair flying in the wind past your hips. Your body cold, clothes asunder, and rain swept, carried you like a child back to the house. So glad for the sofa turned dead. Now awakened, you stare past the ceiling into the heavens, questioning. You know, like any woman, you are alone. Feet propped up on pillows and the sofa arm. A single sheet is both cover and adornment. An outstretched arm grazes the wooden floor. Cry for the girl woman you once inhabited. Fearless one who followed her love out of the reservation into a different life and time. Your breath quickens as you realize. Never had a chance to tell him of this new child coming. All right, uh, give me one second. Um, I'm gonna close with this poem that I wrote for Langston. Um, this is much a part of the pastoral <laughs> as anyone. Um, at 19, what did you know of rivers, of life's ups and downs? A green currents that led to the open sea. To brilliantly buy time among people not your kind, yet using your gifts of charm and friendship to distract those who could make your life much harsher. You were always the bright-faced, handsome young man who knew how to talk to people, to make a poem out of the most common elements, going past limits of race. What did you know of rivers? How to navigate wild rush of circumstances that would change your path in life? What to do with the anguish of the generation before you? To take whatever life threw at you and put it to use? You were always meandering from shore to shore, sometimes wildly thrashing about in currents not of your own making. You moved countless times from your mother to grandmother, from Missouri to Kansas to Ohio, across so many state lines and even to Mexico twice to visit your father. Carrie and James pulled you between them, hoping to make their dreams yours. Why not go to Europe, study to be an engineer and take over the land? Why not get work, any job to support your mother? Penning poems in your free time, lollygagging, staring out of a window, keen on writing. Your dreams were beyond their imagination. What could you know of rivers? Growing up a few miles from the Kansas River, its muddy banks, a daily view. 
You live constantly moving and flowing over rocks and turns in the river as you learn to become everything. Student, busboy, sailor, fellow traveler, reporter, going from screenwriter, poet, translator to Harlem royalty. Yet you went everywhere, Russia, Spain, Cuba, Ghana, Nigeria, and Asia to become yourself. What did you know of the Lawrence or Missouri rivers, of making your own life of letters and adventure? And I'll close with this poem that I wrote for um, uh, my, my uh, grandfather, who I never met, my father's father, lineage. My father's father painted houses, sea foam green, Sea foam green, fuchsia rose, colonial white, mule bone brown. Sea island bread, a salt water Gucci, elegant address, black as they come kind of man. His pretty eyes passed to all his children and to generations who will never know him. Who knows where the line begins? The Gambia, Sierra Leone, Nigeria. My cousin has seen five generations pass through the Congress free house. My father's father, born in the 1890s, among the first generation free of the fields, barely had an education, made sure all his children went to Avery Institute, were counted among the best of the new. My father's father was not considered a fighter, nothing like his son, hot headed known for throwing his bosses overboard and getting into fist fights with racist firemen. My father's father was a so soft-spoken, non-reactionary man, lived among the folk, survived, made do. He was long gone before I was born, married to a brown firebrand woman. His sons were rolling stones, husbands and fathers, men with a trade and men with vision. His only daughter called knowledge into minds and hearts of students, leaving a legacy strong enough to outlast her life. Through a mirror prism, I find your face peering through the bottom of a river, a mist swirling golden light. Hard to tell if it is sunset or dawn where you are. Eugene, you are not forgotten. My cousin keeps your photo rested and pristine on the family piece. Thank you, Okua. And thank you all for coming, <laughs> supporting us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, oh, wonderful, oh, wonderful, Jackie, wonderful. I'm so glad to hear you. You make me feel so warm and wonderful. Oh. I love, love, I, I heard you read that. It was uh, the one with the one you ended with for your grandfather. It strikes me every time, but the Langston one and the other river one, and I'm just like, she is so intuitive because I'm struggling. The poem I I could not finish to read was about rivers, and I was like, what what can I say different about because there's a there's a river like um, six blocks away from me so I've been struggling with um, trying to address this river I I have poems from like decades before but I have this new understanding about this river um, because people killed it <clears throat> they, they 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 choked the river they dammed it up in damming, but listen, and listen, it, 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 in damming up the river, sorry, everybody, but see, Jackie just touches these places in me. In, in damming up the river, they killed a Native American settlement. One of the few, do, do, do you know what so I'm that's saying? The first, this, that's the first line of the poem. That's the, that, it, like a double death. Yeah, that's the first line of your poem. <laughs> I don't always want to punch people. <laughs> anyway, thank you. I was going to ask you about your how your social media feeds include plant and nature 
images from your peregrinations and um and i was was it is it or was it part of your literary concerns but we heard that so it is so that's a silly question but anyway but are you going to do some more with your um with your flower love um i i hope to turn that into some kind of book i um i was telling someone in march of 2020 when we all when everything shut down uh, i picked up my camera and and just started photographing whatever I found in a four block radius, um, you know that was from the natural world, um, and that was my way of uh, countering um, the incredible uh, despair uh, that that was in the that was in the culture. I was like, uh, you got to move, you got to, you know, you, you got to look breathe. at what yeah. You got to look at what the world is showing you. And, uh, you know, what's moving across the world is one thing, but the world itself, you know, is infinite. Right. And, and, and uh, just because the human family's in trouble doesn't mean the whole planet is. <laughs> <laughs> well, ho hopefully not. Although the human family has made trouble for yeah. other for for the uh, for the other members uh, on this planet. Um, you know, they, they shake us off. We can get on their nerves. They just shake us right off. I, I, you make me think of these images I saw of uh, maybe if you haven't seen it, I'll try and find them and send it to you of polar bears mm -hmm. <clears throat> occupying an abandoned weather station. So mm. this, this abandoned weather station, you know, way, way, we're in, po you know, up by the Arctic Circle, but mm -hmm. it's, it's on an island and the polar bears, they're, they're like hanging out in the house, you know, yep. they're yep. like, did you see that with the polar no, bears? No, I haven't, I haven't. It's, it's, but it's so glorious, um, not that the polar bear is in the house, but that, the polar bears using what we abandoned, you know? And so there's, so that in the dystopia, yeah, we go and then the plants come in and then the animals are like, oh, I don't have to build a nest this time. You know, I don't have to build a shelter. Right. This is, this, 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 this'll work, this'll work. Um, what else did I want to ask you about? No, well, no, I really, after I heard the river poems, I was like, oh, no, she's, she's got to help me think about you, you got You got think at least 30 this. poems up your sleeve. Okay. Go, go sit in that dry spot that used to be a river and listen to what it has to say to you. This, this project is such a challenge. When I thought of it, I, the, it's, the intersections are there. And I, I, I don't know if folks appreciate the wonderful uh, bouquet that Jackie just gave me by <laughs> illustrating, like, you know, here's where, here's where the pastoral can come in with some, you know, with, with the speculative, with some, you know, Afrocentric stuff. I mean, such a wonderful, thank you again for the array of work. Uh, but the, the challenge for me, though, is I feel able and willing to do each piece, but to integrate all of them, you know, to have work that actually speaks to all of them. There's another area I was going to say, not quite your, not quite the, I, oh, with the, um, uh, with the Carver poem, hmm. black farmers, and I'm just like I've got to think of something that's speculative, but with black farmers. And I love your what you did is go the science route, and I was like, oh, there we go. Yes, just go into the science, right? Look at the yeah, science. You of it. You can put science in the speculative. You can put science. Well, it is. It's well. It's considered at least by the SFPA. You know the science part of it. So I'm like, okay, okay. There we go. She yeah. she got that too. The, 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 there it is. Pastoral, uh, agrarian, 
uh, science and forward thinking. Just, just lovely. Well, okay, so there's one minute left. I'm sorry to talk, folks. Um, oh, thank you, Fred. Um, let's see. A wonderful evening, inspiring, says Fred. Uh, thank you, Michelle Bottom White, my sister in law. Thank you for coming. Aldrich Crawley, thank you for being here. Let's see, who else? Do I, Judy might be my Judy. I, there were two Judys at one point. Uh, if it's my Judy, hi, Judy. And if it's not my Judy, hi, Judy, anyway. Thank you all for coming. Are there any questions for me or? Um, Jackie, Jacqueline, I get to call her Jackie. I don't know if she lets anybody else in the world do that, but. <laughs> All right for tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. No questions from anybody? All right. Well, it's eight o'clock. So here's what I will say. Um, oh, Albert wants a rocket. Bad Albert. That's my bro. Thank you all very, very, very much. Please stay well, stay healthy. My great thanks to Jacqueline Johnson for sharing her work, for affirming the endeavor and giving me some hints and clues of how to move forward by sharing work of hers that forwards these ideas of the Afrofuturist pastoral speculative poetry. And I will be back in June with Eugene Bacon. But for now, peace and love stay safe and well. May you all thrive. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.